Good evening, dear friends. Uh, welcome to the 22nd edition of the uh, Forum 2000 uh, conference. It is great pleasure to have you all here with us uh, this evening. As you know, uh, the team that we have selected this year, perhaps a, a little controversially, is uh, democracy in need of a critical update. Uh, let me explain uh, why we have uh, done so. For several years now, democracy seems to be at a critical juncture. The system uh, which has delivered unprecedented freedom, prosperity and peace uh, to the parts of the world which have been lucky enough uh, to enjoy it uh, seems to be suddenly caught in a self-destructive cycle. Despite many successes, citizens in different parts of the world seem un unhappy uh, with the current democracy and with the way how it is functioning. And it often shows in the election. United States, Italy, and even Czech Republic can serve as examples of such, uh, such developments. Uh, the fact that democratic system is facing a series of external and ex uh, internal and external uh, challenges and problems uh, is uh, demonstrated by a number of points. We see weak political leadership and lack of vision among the traditional democratic forces. There is an apparent and uh, widespread decline of trust in, uh, uh, in democratic institutions. The elected representatives have often become too distant from the citizens. The resulting empty space is increasingly being filled by simple and clear messages offered by newly emerging politicians and new or rebranded political forces. We also see deep changes in the information space that have completely transformed the way we consume information, but also the way in which the information itself is created and disseminated. Moreover, there are evident social and economic problems that make large segments of the population in uh, democratic countries unhappy, and the acceler accelerating trends of globalization, migration, or technological change that produce growing uncertainty and nervousness. To make things much worse, these internal challenges are being amplified and abused by external forces, namely authoritarian regimes in countries like China and Russia, but also others. These external forces aim to increase their power, influence, boost their international standing, gain economic advantage, or simply sow uncertainty and chaos in the democratic community. The goal of the Forum 2000 and of this conference is to address the problems that the current democracy is facing in a democratic way. We intend to host a free and critical discussion about these issues, invite as many relevant opinions as possible, and from this discussion start formulating some solutions and ways forward. That is why this year we have made an effort to invite also voices that are usually branded as illiberal, populist, irresponsible, or otherwise do not fit into our traditional view of the liberal democratic political system. We have also invited many younger voices. We believe that only through a free and open discussion we can identify relevant ways forward. Democracy gives us one unique privilege. We can freely speak about problems of our government, criticize it, and propose changes. In Havana, this would be impossible. In Moscow, Alexei Navalny has been imprisoned for that exact thing again just last week. In Beijing or elsewhere in China, if trying to speak freely, people can disappear or perish in prison, just like the Nobel Peace Prize laureate Li Xuabo last year. But fortunately, we are here in Prague. So let us use that privilege and freely discuss how we can make our democracy stronger. Now, please let me introduce the first important point of the program of this evening. Many of you know, or most of you hopefully know Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel was a writer, political activist, philosopher, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, and he was also, together with Václav Havel, the co-founder of Forum 2000. Elie Wiesel passed away in 2016, and last week he would have celebrated his 90th, 90th birthday. So today we would like to remember him and his legacy. Therefore, please allow me to invite to the stage someone who has been part of the Forum 2000 family, uh, who has been a close friend, 
and who has also been a close friend to Elie Wiesel. Please in, uh, allow me to invite uh, producer, pianist, educator, Ms. Caroline Stessinger. Tonight, I stand before you as a witness to history. Our recent history uh, from the second half of the 20th century to the present. My life has been blessed by friendships with the extraordinary co-founders of Forum 2000, President Václav Havel and Elie Wiesel. I was there during the most exhilarating years of the new government. My first visit to Park Castle in the early weeks of Havel's presidency was magical. It was the most inspiring experience of my life. Women and men rushing down the corridors on scooters suggested to me the heady days of 1776. I could imagine Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Adams in residence. The atmosphere was truly surreal, but this was real life in real time. These courageous citizens, led by Václav Havel, had brought the Velvet Revolution to victory without firing even one shot. When Havel made his first state visit to Israel, I was on the trip. Frustrated with a very hot day of ribbon cutting and other ceremonies, Havel asked me to cancel the evening's official engagements so he could see Jerusalem for the first time and talk to the people. Avoiding Czech security, we rushed through the kitchen of the King David Hotel to land in a car driven by a former Israeli president. As we strolled through the winding streets of the old Spanish section, under the light of a full moon, the air scented with roses and jasmine, Havel suddenly said, look up there. It's Fiddler on the Roof come to life. What he had noticed was a violinist practicing on the balcony of a school building. His keynote speech in Bruno for the first festival of the Roma people, 10,000 Roma, was even more touching. He began with, you and your people suffered countless deaths under the Nazis and untold persecution and prejudice from the communists. Now, he said, you enjoy the same freedoms as all Czech citizens, but you are held responsible for the same laws of our nation. Thousands of Roma Standing, shouting, Viva Havel, their hands extended in the V sign, brought tears to many eyes. During that same period, Elie Wiesel and his family lived two blocks away from me and joined us at our house for dinner at least twice weekly. We laughed, we argued, we cried together. If public or private tragedies intervened, Ellie spoke of the power of hope. When I invited Havel to speak at a televised program in Oslo, sponsored jointly by the Elie Wiesel Foundation and the Nobel Peace Committee, he accepted. Oslo, 
late August 1990, President Havel addressed an audience of over 1,500 invited guests, including the King of Norway, Nelson Mandela, who had just been released from prison, and Presidents Mitterrand and Jimmy Carter. He closed his remarks with, I always carry hope in my heart, for hope is as great a gift from God as life itself. Later that same evening, I introduced Wiesel to President Havel. No wonder they immediately recognized each other as intellectual and emotional brothers. They even shared their humor. Wiesel tried out one of his favorite jokes, hoping to hear Havel's laughter. A Harvard professor, he said, asked his class recently, uh, please explain, what is worse, indifference or apathy? A student quickly answered and said, I don't care and I don't know. So naturally, when Havel asked Wiesel what he believed they could do together, Wiesel retorted, let's begin with an international conference. Havel replied, great idea. How soon can we start? No written proposal, no meetings, just a handshake between two great men. And here we are, more than 20 years later. At the time of Wiesel's death two years ago, President Barack Obama said of his close friend, Elie Wiesel, was the conscience of the world. After we walked together among the barbed wire and guard towers at Buchenwald, where he was imprisoned as a teenager, Ellie spoke words I will never, never forget. Memory has become a sacred duty of all people of goodwill. Others credited with Ellie Wiesel with literally making memory a commandment. Wiesel survived Auschwitz to become the spokesman, not only for victims of the Holocaust, but for the oppressed of all religions, races, and nationalities. Endowed with a stunning intellect, Elie was a very gentle but powerful influence who never feared speaking truth to power. Frequently, he would repeat, we must all have the courage to speak truth to power. For me, that's one of the most important things we can do today. He opposed apartheid in South Africa. He begged President Clinton to stop the killing in Rwanda and Bosnia. At the White House, in a face-to-face -face confrontation on national television, Ellie pled with President Reagan to cancel his trip to the Bitburg Cemetery to honor the graves of Nazi generals. Your place, Mr. President, is with the victims. He wrote hundreds of letters to world leaders urging the power brokers to choose justice over politics. We are all morally obligated to take a stand against evil. Wiesel stressed this when he wrote, wherever men and women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must at that time become the center of the universe. Throughout the more than 40 years of my friendship with Elie Wiesel, he frequently spoke of an ancient story of the 36 just men. According to this legend, 36 honorable men are always in our midst, working to protect, us, to protect justice. If one of them dies, he is replaced by another equally righteous person. But if all 36 cease to exist, 
It means the beginning of the end of the world. Over the years, Ellie modernized the legend by including women and increasing the number of the just to accommodate the growing populations. During our final conversation, a few days before his death, Ali whispered to me, remember the tale of the 36 just men. Most legends are fiction. This legend contains truth. Eli Wiesel and Václav Havel, two giants who bridged the late 20th and early 21st centuries, are gone. And they've not been replaced. Maybe they cannot be replaced. Truth has become a nasty word. We, the people, are intentionally fed lies instead of truth, bombast rather than reasoned argument. Our democracies are threatened, our freedoms under attack in this increasingly very dangerous world. Wiesel and President Havel urged us to do our best to exercise our duties as good citizens, to reject apathy, and above all, to keep hope alive. We need the wisdom of Václav Havel and Elie Wiesel more than ever now. We need the 36 or the 36,000 or 36 million just men and women of the legend. We need them now desperately. Thank you. Elie Wiesel has been my teacher for more than 50 years. He had to bear witness to the past and influence the future. Well, when I see him, he's optimistic. He's optimistic. He has been the moral conscience of our generation. When my husband and I look back at our years in the White House, one of the highlights are the times that we've been able and been privileged to spend with Ellie and Marion. We always feel enriched by our experience. The impact that I feel that Ellie has on me and on the world is that out of the darkest of human behavior must come love. That hatred has to be a singular orphan in this world. And that love is the only answer. His emphasis that we must never forget, I think, is a lasting heritage which uh, will benefit future generations. Forgive, yes, but forget, no. Elie Wiesel saw evil up close. He saw what evil can do to the hearts, minds, and actions of human beings. What have you learned? We have learned some lessons, minor lessons perhaps, that we are all responsible, and indifference is a sin and a punishment. And we have learned that when people suffer, we cannot remain indifferent. And Mr. President, I cannot not tell you something. I have been in the former Yugoslavia, last fall. I cannot sleep since of what I have seen. Something, as a Jew I am saying that, we must do something to stop the bloodshed in that country. He has a love affair with words. Um, and he inspired, I mean, words matter. 
It's not just a thought. Words matter. And I've never, I've never met anyone in my life, and I've met every major world leader in the last 40 years, I mean, literally. Um, but he has a way. And he, I, think his, I think his words will live on. How can I thank you for building bridges between generations? Do I have the right to represent the multitudes who have perished? No one may speak for the dead. No one may interpret their mutilated dreams and visions. Because if we forget, we are guilty. We are accomplices. That when their voices are stifled, we shall lend them ours. That while their freedom depends on ours, the quality of our freedom depends on theirs. Our lives no longer belong to us, no longer belong to us alone. They belong to all those who need us desperately. Justice, justice, you must run after. He said, to remain silent and indifferent is the greatest sin of all. What Ellie has done in his lifetime, though, is remarkable. With his partner, Mary, and the two of them have simply been an inspiration to the rest of the world. Through his books, through his speeches, but most importantly, through his work. He has demonstrated what love is all about. He has demonstrated what forgiveness is all about. But he has also done it in the spirit of never forget. The two things, the two people I put in a completely different category than everyone else I've ever met are Nelson Mandela and Ellen Mizzou. And so, once again, I think of the young Jewish boy from the Carpathian Mountains he has accompanied the old man I have become throughout these years of quest and struggle. And together we walk towards the new millennium, carried by profound fear and extraordinary hope. Dear delegates, ladies and gentlemen, as in previous years, it is a great honor to address you at the opening ceremony of the 22nd Forum 2000 Conference. The title of this year's meeting is Democracy in Need of a Critical Update? Question mark at the end. This very question mark is the challenge that arose for various meanings. Its obvious meaning invites a straight answer. Either, yes, democracy really needs an update, or no, it doesn't need any. As we think it over, we may want to start with the very term democracy. Do we mean by it the ideal system of government much discussed by philosophers since the age of enlightenment? Or do we have in mind the various concrete implementations of the idea of democracy in the current world? There is also another, more particular meaning of the question mark. What sort of criticism 
incites us to deliberate about the need to improve democracy? Is it an inherent weakness of democratic systems which accounts for their susceptibility to populism, nationalism, xenophobia, internet misuse, spread of fake news, and even to contagious hysteria that draws our attention? So, indeed, we have an abundance of question marks, and you are lucky to have still two days to ponder them. Please do not expect me to deal with them here. One thing, however, does cross my mind. Ordinarily, when people deliberate on the strengths and weaknesses of one another form of democratic governance, they are thinking primarily of the future. They are mostly concerned with the issue of what needs inventing in order to strengthen the, the strengths and weaken the weaknesses of democracy in times yet to come. So, why not to look back at the true historical origins of democracy? Perhaps we can learn something from its beginning in ancient Athens. I am not thinking of, the, of that aspect of Athenian democracy called direct democracy, a concept recently revived in the somewhat fragile idea of national referendums. I have in mind something intrinsic. That is the idea of the personal appearance of citizens in a public space. Let me quote in this regard the following statement by the well-known political philosopher Hannah Arendt. The space of appearance comes to being wherever men are together in the matter of speech and action and therefore predates and precedes all formal constitution of the public realm and the various forms of government. That is, the various forms in which the public realm can be organized. What I want to highlight today is the priority of this direct personal presence. It is something that is gradually fading away from the public sphere, now mostly displaced by impersonal media and the all-pervasive internet. Yet, only actual physical presence, direct eye contact and linguistic, facial and bodily expression can expose the very veracity of one's position and arguments during public debates. Of course, this only applies to a small community of people, but where else to begin a learned deliberation about democracy? Indeed, prior to any formal political process, whether direct or indirect, everybody should have the opportunity to interact in person with his or her fellow citizens, thereby participating in political and civic life of all. Even you will have in the remaining two days a special opportunity to consider the fate of democracy, whether it will flourish or decay, improve or die. So let me wish you and the 22nd Forum 2000 the greatest success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Havel. 
I think there are many responses that will reach, hopefully but will not reach the one that you mentioned in the end. I'm, not, I'm sure that democracy will not die, but I'm sure we'll be discussing some important changes that are currently taking place. As, all, as you all know, uh, each year Forum 2000 hosts a number of brave activists and human rights defenders uh, from around the world. They usually come from countries that are very different, but face often more or less tough restrictions on freedom. And in many of them, uh, even our imperfect democracy is uh, only a distant dream. Their stories remind us that we never, never must give up the struggle against evil. Today we are proud to welcome uh, four young, extremely courageous and important people from four very different countries. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Arzu Gebulaeva, who is an independent journalist from Azerbaijan, who uncovers the abuses of the current authoritarian regime in Baku and advocates for a peaceful resolution of the Azeri-Armenian conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh. Among other media, she also cooperates with the Armenian newspaper Agos, for which she has been a target of a number of threats. Let me also welcome Juraj Šeliga. He is a PhD student from Slovakia, uh, and after the assassination of the journalist Jan Kuciak and his girlfriend, he co-organized demonstrations that eventually led to the resignation of the Slovak Prime Minister, Robert Fico. <laughs> Andrea Papus Ngombet Maleva, is an activist from Congo Brazzaville. He opposes the corrupt rule of President Denis Sassungueso and denounces the government's growing ties with the communist China. <laughs> uh, and last but not least, let me invite to the podium Rafael Requesens. She's a student leader from Venezuela who is active in the struggle against the dictatorship of Nicolas Maduro. And uh, Rafaela's brother uh, has been here. He's also an opposition leader and he has been here at Forum 2000 four years ago and is now one of the more than 400 countries' political prisoners. As I said, each of these people is from a very different country, but they all have dreams for their country's better future. Therefore, we have asked each of them a simple question. What do I wish for my country? Additionally, after our four speakers, when they finish their remarks, we will hear from one, one more very dear person, an activist from Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe Niaradzo Mashayombe. Niaradzo, however, will express herself in music. So please welcome our courageous speakers again. These have been tough times for democracy advocates and proponents. We're living in liquid times trying to stand on moving sands in the world that is full of unprecedented challenges. One of my favorite writers, Elif Shafak, sums it well in a story she shared in one of her recent talks. She mentions this club called Worried and Depressed International Writers Club. Each time it's members who are from countries like Egypt, Turkey, Russia, Venezuela, Nigeria, come together at international events and conferences, Shafak recalls they would smile at each other in sympathy as camaraderie of the doomed. But more recently, explains Shafak, the club has welcomed new members from places like Poland, Hungary, Greece, Austria, France, and United States. Suddenly, there were more of us worried about our nations and the future of our world, explained Shafak in her talk. I might not be a member of that club, but I'm too worried about the future of my country and the world. So here I am, standing in front of you tonight, tasked with a very tough question of what is it that I wish for my own country, Azerbaijan. 
I love my motherland, but a place I call home has never been mine. It has been in the hands of illiberal politicians exploiting it. These so-called leaders have looted its resources, gained power at the expense of others, and who have turned my motherland into a fiefdom. As a result, Azerbaijan is known for its devastating press freedom record, grave human rights abuses, abducting its journalists and smuggling them back into the country, for money laundering, secret slush funds, and Panama paper leaks. So what can someone like me, who has never had a chance to have, to have a say in the present and the future of my country, wish for it? A chance for free and fair elections, plurality of opinions and voices, ensuring equality and fostering transparency. To me, these are some of the most important pillars of democracy. Now, how to achieve these, that's the hardest part. I think a good place to start would be getting some inspiration from Ambrogio Lorenzetti's 14th century fresco on the allegory of good and bad government. For the sake of time and context, I, won't, I will focus on the good because we know all too well how the bad government looks. In the fresco on good government, you see the commune who tells the people that they should be the ones who rule themselves and not by their queens and kings. Surrounding commune are his advisors, justice, and throne looking up at the figure of wisdom who supports the scales of justice, harmony, binding justice to the citizens, and peace. And watching over the republic is security, with a banner that reads, everyone shall go forth freely and without fear. This is how I imagine Azerbaijan, a nation freed of a tyrant guided by justice, who at present sits in shackles at the feet of our leadership, where civic ideals and plurality of opinions are celebrated rather than perish in prisons, where civil society is vibrant and where a nation isn't governed by fear, but by solidarity and freedom. Thank you. Dobrý večer. Good evening. Uh, when I got a question from the organizers, I thought uh, what comes to my mind was very practical stuff. What do I wish for my country? I thought about the economic regulation. I thought about the, our partnership and membership of the EU and NATO and all others like welfare and social care and health care. But then I realized I should stop and think back why me, my friends, were standing at the squares and the streets on March when we learned about the murder of Jan Kuciak and Martina Kushnirova. Why we organized the marches and the protest for a distant Slovakia. And these were our these were our motivations and these are our, our, our wishes for Slovakia. The first one is decency. Decency as a structural element of our society. Decency as a starting point of our human interaction. And the decency as a bridge, bridge among the cultural and ideological difference with differences. My second wish is, is trust. We know that we are, experiences, we are experiencing uh, the crisis of the trust. We are experiencing the people are stopping trust each other. We know how low is the trust to the government. And I think the realization of the decency is based on trust. The decency is a ground for a trust. And we know that with no trust, there is no real discussion. With no real discussion, there is no democracy. And the last but not least, my wish is justice. Justice as a protection of decency and trust. Justice for everybody. 
from powerless to powerful justice for very normal people in the east part of the Slovakia, justice for minorities, and justice for politicians which are misusing the power which we put them into the hands. These are my three wishes for Slovakia and these were reasons why we stand and still standing for decent country, for decent future. Thank you. I would like first to thank the Forum 2000 team for inviting me and also want to thank Karl Gershman of the NAID for facilitating this connection. I'm Andrea Gombe from the Republic of Congo, better known as Congo Brazzaville. It's a Central Africa country of roughly 4 million souls as well as the vanguard of China's noxious influence in Africa. We don't have hidden advanced technology like Wakanda, just hidden money in numerous fiscal paradise. My team and I advocate tirelessly for profound democratic change in Congo Brazzaville. We hope to leapfrog from being a rogue state to become a free nation. We dream of food security, proper health care, mobile governance, civic technology, world-class education, and for me, a space launch facility. I like space. We forecast a river canal that will link city from Brazzaville, Kinshasa, to the port of Pointe Noire on the Atlantic Ocean. We have a bold plan to empower the indigenous people of the Congo Red rainforest and creative solution for the all revenue problems. We want to eradicate malaria and other common tropical infectious disease, giving Congo Brazzaville ideological geographic position on the equator and a shared time zone with Western Europe, we believe that a nascent space industry will certainly be benefit our country and its closest European partner. But our hope and dream depend on the establishment of a functional democracy based on the respect of the rule of law. We wish to take the Congo Brazzaville from the fringe of the international community to the epicenter of the civic tech movement. And though we have some of the largest oil reserves in the African continent, my country, Congo Brazzaville, have enormous potential. Rectifying the error of an incompetent and corrupt ruling elite, which scattered several billion of dollars of oil revenue for the past three decades, is no simple to, to not easy task to make. But more importantly, we want to move from all dependence. We want to develop an economy driven by a strong services sector and a highly skilled labor force. Our small population, four million souls, should not be seen as a negative point, but as an advantage to achieve very rapidly that change. With your support, we can become a beacon of democracy in sub-Saharan Africa. We can set an example which in turn will inspire our counterpart in Africa and eventually contribute significantly to solving the migrant crisis. To end, I think democracy is an universal ideal. Keeping it alive should not be the burden of a Western country alone. We Congolese Democrats are ready to take our part of this. Thank you. Thanks for in 2000 for this invitation and this opportunity, and thanks present. It's hard to say what I wish for my country in a few minutes. However, I have half of my youth fighting for it. Four years ago, my brother, deputy of the National Assembly, Juan Requesens, 
has the opportunity to be invited to this forum. Today, he is a victim of same reality he reported in 2014. My brother, Juan Requesens, has been kidnapped by the regime for two months. That's why, if you ask me what I wish for my country, I cannot want anything other than democracy. For me, democracy today means having a full home, having my brother coming home and seeing his two children grow, grow up, means not having to see my friend running out through the borders. For me, democracy means that our universities could be places of investigation, academy and debate, without being afraid of being closed or economically suffocated. For me, democracy represents the opportunity to give life to those who are dying today, to give freedom to those who are behind bars. For me, democracy is even above my life. The representative democracy established in our Constitution is not being respected. Mayors like David Smolansky today are in exile, and deputies like Juan Requesens are imprisoned today for speaking up his mind. The world knows that us, Venezuelans, have fought for democracy. I swear we have. My generation, youth and student sector can't find in other country opportunities for progress. This is why we decide to fight for democracy, because we refuse to see more people dying on the street, more people eating from the trash, doctors and professors starving because their salary is less than a dollar and teacher raising children from the ground who have fainted because they have not eaten in days. Today, I ask you as a student, leading of the most important university in the country, the Central University of Venezuela, on behalf of all Venezuelan youth and the student movement, on behalf of all those who have had to flee from Venezuela, as a sister, as a daughter, as a Venezuelan, please do not leave us. Here we are representative of various organizations and institutions that today fight for human rights, for justice, for freedom and democracy. I ask you to assume a commitment to look for the means to support the Venezuelan youth that today continues fighting not to surrender despite the fear, in spite of the frustration, in spite of the hunger, in spite of going through the worst crisis in the history of our country. The youngest, the students, all of us, we decide not to give up. Why do I wish for my country? Justice for our brothers, skillless in protest, like Juan Pernalete, Neomar Lander, Carlos Moreno, Fabian Urbina, heroes of my generations. I wish freedom for the more than 250 political prisoners, like Leopoldo Lopez, Manuel Chacin, my brother, Juan Requesens, who today are behind bars or thinking differently. I want the next generations do not have to live what today we have to live. And this could only be possible in democracy. Today, yo me niego a rendirme. I refuse to surrender. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, greetings from Zimbabwe, Makadini. So my struggle is a struggle within a struggle. When I'm thinking of democracy, human rights, I'm thinking of the woman, the youths. Where are they? So I present to you my piece called Watintum Fazi, Watintum Bogodo. You hit a woman, you strike a woman, you strike a rock.
You leave a woman behind. You leave a rock. You harm a woman. Society is in turmoil. You leave a woman behind. You leave a rock. You harm a woman. Society is in turmoil. Oh, what in two fast away now? Your democracy, my democracy, our democracy is democracy when everybody is included. It is democracy when we can all be heard. It is democracy when everybody can speak their mind out without fear or favor. My democracy consists of a struggle within a struggle. A struggle for women and youth to learn, to be heard and to be represented. My dream democracy is inclusive, one where women and girls are not rewarded with insults, profanity, humiliation to stay out of politics. Where women are not killed for different political choices than their own husbands. Where mature male leaders support young women to participate in public life. Where religious norms and old traditions such as child marriages no longer have a hold on girls. My democracy is a place of power because where the weak become the powerful, the powerful becoming the weak. It is a place of grace, humility, and inclusive, inclusivity that recognizes its own power and the power to change the narrative. My democracy, your democracy, our democracy is inclusive. What in tum fazi? What in tim bogoto? What in amkati? What in adumbo? You leave a woman behind. You leave a rock. You harm a woman. Society is in turmoil. You leave a woman behind. You leave a rock, you harm a woman, society is in turmoil. Oh, what in tum fazi we na we My democracy is inclusive. My democracy goes together. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Nirazo. So the program of the Forum 2000 opening is gradually drawing near the end. Uh, but before we finish, I would like to, to invite you to the uh, conference discussions that will be taking place for most of the day tomorrow and on Tuesday. We will touch upon the issues that I have mentioned in the beginning, but also many more. I would also like to invite you to the rich accompanying program that some of you may have already uh, encountered in the streets of Prague and in the different venues, uh, Festival of Democracy. Within the Festival of Democracy, we have prepared over 60 events here in Prague, uh, but also around the Czech regions and in the neighboring countries. These are panels, discussions, exhibitions, concerts, and many other, many other events. Uh, before I see the floor to the final musical performance, uh, I need to do one important thing. Uh, I would like to thank our donors and supporters, without whom we would never be able to prepare uh, this uh, annual meeting. They are the National Endowment for Democracy, 
the Avast Foundation, Yulans Posten Fund, International Visegrad Fund, Deloitte, Carnegie Corporation of New York, Friedrich Naumann Foundation, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic, Helena and Jürgen Hofmeister, Jan Barta, Blíšk Sobě Foundation, Taipei Cultural and Economic Office, European, Council, uh, European Commission, Czech German Future Fund, and many and many others. We are truly grateful to them. Uh, and I would finally also like to thank the Forum 2000 Board of Directors, led by Tomáš Vrba, the Conference Program Committee, and our amazing team, and dozens of volunteers who have worked tirelessly to make this uh, event happen. So thank you very much to all of them. And now please welcome Nierzo for the final musical performance, and then you are all invited to the uh, glass of wine afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jakub, for having me here and uh, those who support um, the farm. Now, I work in human rights and democracy and our work is very hard. You all agree here. Everybody here agrees. We need to have a little fun, right? We need to loosen up. So I'm going to invite you in the spirit of Africa to stand to your feet some people pretend to, uh, some people prefer to, to dance while they're sitting. I think we will not have that today. <laughs> you can just, you know, you know move, uh, move your, your, your hips if you like, like me. But I know that some of you are not used to that. But you can just stand and clap. What it, do whatever you can. Just loosen up today as we start the forum. So enjoy the song of Africa. I know a lot of things happen in Africa. And a lot of things that you hear are bad things. But there's also the good side of Africa. We love to dance. We love to have fun. So I invite you all to rise up with me and have fun with the song called A Happy Day. Right. Okay. I'm going to be teaching you some moves. A day in Africa is a happy day. It's a happy day. Come on, you're doing great. A day. You just enjoy yourself. Just try to move your, your body. Happy day. Water from the river, fathers heading cats all in the hood. It is a perfect day. Yeah. Oh, children are playing in the yard. Mothers fetching water from the river. Father 
Thank you very much, Fred. 